Hi, I'm Stephanie Shelton, and this is episode 15 of Conversations on Health, How We Get There. Now, open enrollment for 2024 for Medicare supplementary plans continues into December, while those under 65 who don't have employer health insurance can look for Obamacare plans on state marketplaces until mid-January. In episode 14, we talked mainly about how those Obamacare plans work. Now we're focusing more on Medicare, more on the difference between Medicare Advantage and purely supplementary plans. And toward the end, we're going to do some blue skying about the future of Medicare and healthcare in general and how we're going to pay for it. Here's part two of my discussion with Dr. Stephen D. Culler, Associate Professor at the Rollins School of Public Health and Affiliated Associate Professor at the Guazetta Business School at Emory University in Atlanta. I think most people don't understand that. I I, I I don't think even in the United States today and the working population, people under don't understand that, you know, if I travel and I get and I get sick, I'm out of network. And so my deductible is now, you know, 35 percent instead of 10 percent oh. <laughs> or copay 35 instead of 10. And so people don't really understand how their health insurance works because they have got sick very often and they often don't get sick when they travel so, so they don't have those experiences you know uh and and like i said i i think that you know i said this at the beginning if if people really understood their coverage they wouldn't be so happy with employer benefits and we we might have a national health insurance plan so, so uh and but they, that, that's that's the that's the that's the real risk with the Medicare van. And, and like I would say this to you, I've, I've studied this stuff since well, I've worked in, <laughs> in, in at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in the in the 80s and, and was the Medicare. Every year, week, the Federal Register came out and I read the registry on Thursday to see if there's anything in the federal government about changing payment in the Medicare program because Blue Cross man managed the, the claims for all the Medicare plans. And so I knew more than anybody ever should ever have to know about Medicare. Mm -hmm. And and I still find that it's just incredibly complicated uh, and people just do not understand what they're giving up when they go from a, a traditional plan back to to the uh, the advantage plan. And I, I would say what I was going to say is I personally don't know what I would do if I had tomorrow decide <laughs> if, if I quit Emory and have to decide what to do. So you know, it would I would have to sit down and really, really think about where I think my life's going to go from here. Yeah. And of course, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know, but That's you know, you know your health, scary. your family health history, you know. <laughs> yeah, but the thing that's scary is, you know, yeah. you, you sign up for something and you have to stick with it for a yeah. year. Yeah. And, you know, you can walk out of your house the next day and, and a tree falls on your head. Right, or you get hit by a car. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you have um, a car accident and all of a sudden. I, I do read that um, about 50% of those on Medicare are on Advantage plans. Yeah, so it's almost up to 50%, and partly because it's so low out of pocket. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, again, if we wanted to solve certain different problems, but but again, you know, we start Medicare at 65, where most people are still relatively healthy. Yeah. You know, and 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 other than the obesity crisis that has created comorbidities in that age group, uh, you know, if you looked, it was really not until '75 in this country that that, that people started using a lot of health care. You know, uh, but you know, now we got you know, like with the obesity stuff, it's going to be very interesting to see how Medicare ch changes down the road because you got so many obese people who have had heart diseases at 50. <laughs> yeah. I think I, you know, if they only look at it on a cost benefit basis, right. Yeah. Question of, do you save more money by giving them these drugs or do you save more money by letting them get sick and yeah. then having to pay for it later? And yeah, right. Yeah. No, no, that's an expensive drug that comes along. You but know? remember, in this U.S. healthcare system, the people making those choices have very different horizons because if I'm a private insurer and you're 50 and obese, 
I know you're not going to, at best, you're going to work 10 years, <laughs> you know, and, and what, you know, and you're going to get sick. If you're going to have a heart attack, it's probably in the Medicare program. So I, I don't want to give you the drug because I don't want to pay for the drug because you're not going to have a heart attack in the next 10 years. You oh. know? <laughs> so if you think about it, you know, there's, there, you know, Medicare really, the fact that people can get into Medicare at 65, it changes how employers think about covering certain things that have that long-term cost benefit trade-off, right? Um, that's a question I'm going to leave till the very end to ask okay. you about yeah. So yeah. Further on this area. Yeah. So let me go back to the yeah. uh, open enrollment. So the other choices that you have are, are um, what I call a secondary plan, which is something that pays part of your your twenty percent copay for a doctor's uh, visit. Uh -huh. if, you get, if you get past the um, the deductible and the drug plan for for Part D, yeah, and um, those are the things that are most difficult. It seems to me to to figure out which yeah. one would be better for you. Yeah, and what's even more confusing is that a lot of the Medicare Advantage plans roll the drug plan into that Vantage plan. So, so often you're making a choice between Part A and B, the traditional plan, and Part D versus C, the Medicare Advantage that includes the everything. Uh, you know, hospital, physician, and 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 drugs. So so it makes it even more confusing. <laughs> uh, but but again, I think the Part D market, the drug insurance market, has worked very well. Uh, you you have I don't know six hundred and some plans in the United States. They've been fairly stable. But again, I think I think that yes, you're right. It's very very hard to make those decisions because you're comparing like two premiums versus one premium. So. And, and do people make their decisions primarily? I mean, again, it's of course, whether you're healthy or not uh, Yeah. Um, on the premiums they pay or, you know, um, one doctor once told me that, that um, the average 55 and up person takes five medications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how would you do that without a drug plan? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, again, I always laugh. You know, Medicare didn't have a drug plan until what was it, ninety uh, six? Yeah, it was Bush. It was. Yeah, right. So, 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 you know, I mean, everybody says Medicare is great, but didn't even have drug coverage. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I don't know how if you're fifty five and older, you would ever not have in drug insurance. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. a lot of people don't. Okay. A lot of people don't. Yes, but but again, I think you know and the plans are cheap, as far as I can tell. I mean, relatively speaking. Well, given how expensive the drugs are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, if you yeah. take, if, for instance, you take a lot of generic drugs. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't take much, and uh, in, in terms of a monthly premium, to get them all pretty much covered. Right. No, you're 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 right. I mean, I think that. You know the drug plans are are very good. I was just going to say the reason some people don't buy the drug plan if they're don't have a lot of cash income is that they they most of them don't believe the drugs always work, so they just quit taking them. So, so again, you 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 one of the biggest problems in the United States, even in the employer sector, is that you know. We have all these people who have been identified as having AFib, and the maintenance of that is some kind of anticoagulant, so you don't have a heart, a, a stroke or a clot that creates a stroke. And yet, most because the drugs are relatively expensive out of pocket uh, in employer plans, uh, they just quit taking it because they don't want to pay $350 a quarter for the drug. Or well, you can, uh, some of them can't pay. You know? And some of them can't, but they just, another, you know. another uh, podcast as in. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I just, I just got a paper published last week that we looked at the one, uh, we looked in the Medicare program of people who knew that they, well, they had, they had AFib, they went to the hospital for a stroke and they weren't taking uh, any blood thinner. And the, the 
you know, it's over $60,000, around $60,000 a year for one year following that stroke. Uh, the stroke hospitalization the next year of care costs Medicare almost $60,000. So you, you can see, you know, where that, you know, most of those strokes would have been prevented if they were actually on a, on a, on the, on the drug. And, and sometimes I, I always say the health insurance plans aren't really smart. <laughs> they should force people to take those things. They should give them to them free. You know? Yeah. In the end, yeah. it would be less, a whole less cost. A lot less expensive. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Yeah. So now you're in the marketplace, uh, yeah. Or, or you're you're in the in the uh, window the six yeah right right you're in the open enrollment open period. enrollment period for Medicare yeah um and you make your decision are yeah. you stuck in let's say you take um an well any of the three of the of the choices you take an advantage yeah. plan or you take a secondary plan plus a drug plan are you yeah. stuck with that for the whole year so my understanding is if you go manage care advantage any you can quit anytime and go back to A and B. Okay. okay? Uh, you have that right. Uh, you not necessarily guarantee that you can take another Vantage plan, but but my understanding is if you're not happy with your insurance plan and you take a Vantage plan, you can quit that plan uh, and and go back. You may be you know because you paid the premium at the beginning of the year or the or the month, uh, you probably start Medicare at the beginning of the next month, and so you would not have a coverage lap. Right. But that's my uh, that's my understanding, but I'm not an expert on that particular topic <laughs> but my understanding is you can you can quit the plan if you didn't like it because that's how they originally convinced people to leave part a and b and then the other way around if you want to um yeah the other way around is more complicated because you got you have to pass a some kind of medical thing and the, or the insurance company in the in the managed care has a right to look at your medical record and 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 not choose you is my, that's really? my that's my understanding that's my so understanding. That's still with us that's i still true. believe that is true yes yeah okay so that's a problem yeah so no i it yeah and it, it it it's not as big a problem as if you think historically when there was only part a and b because you can just stay there <laughs> you know so, so 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 again it's it's just it's only a problem if you have out of pocket cost problems and and you can't find another low cost plan if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So um if you choose uh whatever you choose, the advantage yeah. or 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 the other supplementary plans, or you choose nothing. Yeah. And then during the year, you either move to another location where your if the plan you've chosen is not licensed and or something happens to you so yeah i i mean i don't know exactly how that works my uh, my my sort of gut feel is that because these are you know these managed care plans are being sold in the area. They are good anywhere, but you would just be out of pocket. You would be out of network for any care if you move very far right. away. Yeah. If you have a drug, let's say you're in the other direction. So you yeah. have, um, say, Humana for a secondary plan to help right. defray that 20% that right. you have to pay. And um, you have a drug plan. Right. And all of a sudden, um, you... Or, or you don't have a drug plan. Yeah. Go without the drug plan. And all of a sudden you develop a condition for which you start needing a fairly expensive drug. Yeah. Can you purchase a drug plan in the middle of the year or do you have to wait yeah. for the year to turn I, around? I, I think you can. I think though that the way the Part D works, if you don't have the man, the traditional Medicare Part D, if you don't, if you're not continuously covered from the time you start taking Medicare until uh, today, then they they charge you a premium for the insurance package, and it's relatively significant. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but it, it's it, there is a so so if if the premium is four hundred dollars a year or seven hundred dollars a year, it may be twenty percent or something. So you you pay a penalty for not being in the drug plan, and that's continuous coverage. Okay. So anytime you drop a Medicare drug plan and don't have another one, then you, you would pay a premium for that. 
because they don't want people to do that. That was the big concern when in in the Republican Party, when uh, they put that plan together was that people, you know, people who turn 65 weren't going to buy the drug plan until they were 80 and using drugs. And so there's a significant penalty if you don't buy Part D from the beginning. So my advice to everybody is make sure you stay on Part D the whole time. Okay, so beginning to kind of wrap yeah. things up and look sure. look ahead um you touched on this a little bit we're we're going to have to find better ways to fund medicare and right. and social security right well um yeah. you know as as more and more people age into medicare yeah. you know get the yeah. whole boomer you know generation well. Yeah, let's let's uh, so let's talk about Medicare, right? And Medicaid. Right. And and the reason I tied the two together just before you go into that is that one of my ways of dealing with it, since you've already raised the age for Social Security, yeah. Um, they used to be tied together. It was sixty-five. Right. Yeah, it used to. So be. you raise the age for Medicare, and you make companies cover if you're working for them up to yeah. that point right yeah and then you put the rest of the people in the in the uh, affordable care marketplace yeah right no I, I i mean that that would be the easiest thing to do uh uh you know uh i think that you know again if you look at before COVID, at least life expectancy was going up. <laughs> and so if you sort of look at Medicare versus life expectancy, it, it would probably be 70 today, <laughs> you know, but, right. but, uh, you know, so if you, if you wanted to say we, we, we set 65 because that was 10 years of life expectancy, that would mean now we would be somewhere in the seventies as a starting point. So, uh, and, and again, I think you're, you know, the idea that if you really do retire at 65, then there's, there's some supplemental, or, you know, you use the public exchange, the ACA to, to get coverage until you turn 65. Um, uh, so I, I think that that's probably ha would be something that could work very well. And, and again, it would, would not require additional money being thrown into the program, probably. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think that, you know, that there, there are, there's, there, it's, there's a lot of other ways to think about it. And, and again, I, I, I think there's trade-offs between whether you try to do it, how, how you try to do it. I just think right now, what may not be, continue to work very long is is the fact that it, what medicare really is is a huge transfer of wealth from the working generation to the elderly people right because <laughs> we're paying their health care right and and so the 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 question becomes and again you know my kids you know you're you're now looking at you know, paying into a program that's not going to be there when you're there, or <laughs> you're going to be paying in a lot more the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I think that, that something has to happen. I, I don't think they can continue to just raise the Medicare tax because, uh, I mean, again, I, I do some independent work and it always stuns me how much <laughs> that, you know, it's almost, it's over 7% now uh, of any dollar you earn uh, in income go gets taxed just to Medicare, not right. to mention Social right. Security. Yeah. No, it used to come out of your social social security tax. Yeah, yeah right. And they, so they it's separate. And yeah. uh, I see that on my, you know, on yeah, my you, you, yeah, you've worked oh, probably independent for longer. But but yeah, that's that's the part that that, you know, again, we need to think about as a country whether we want to continue to have you know, intergenerational transfers of wealth around healthcare, or whether or not we want to figure out some way to, you know, have some payment into uh, uh, that, that's, that's, you know, again, maybe more, uh, you know, again, I always say these things like, uh, you know, there could be some kind of inheritance tax or something that, that, that gets, 
all, all that money that an inheritance tax goes into some kind of fund for the elderly health care, or maybe you even have something where, you know, God forbid you, uh, you give people choices to, you know, do some of these experimental things that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars that, that, uh, you know, you, you, if they don't do it, the family gets some kind of some portion of that savings or something. So there's a lot of game theory you could play about how you could, you know, get rid of that high cost at the end of life, if you know what I'm saying. So, and, and again, the, but because if you look at it, you know, most people in Medicare, you know, 90% of their Medicare costs or spending occurs in the last nine months of their life. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of that is, is when they're laying in a bed and they're basically not coherent. <laughs> and, and so the quality of life is, you know, my mind is, is very low, but, but that's my personal view of the stuff that, that you're going, you're going off on an, on another direction. The tan tangent. Well, but my tangent is that we got to, we got to think about when, when people should, or what are the options to end life or, 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 or do something slightly different. And I thought it's, I think it's sort of interesting and that Jimmy Carter chose hospice care and now he's lived for six months. So, <laughs> so, so, that's not people's view of hospice care, but it, it was going on even before that. But it'll be very interesting with his experience if that'll change people's sort of view about not having intense treatment for for a disease or something like that. I don't know. I know that that has to be enough people who just say, you know, I I I don't I just don't want to do it. Yeah, and right. that also goes into the concept of social care, which we don't right. We have, don't do in this country at all. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and which they're having a problem with now in the UK because yeah. they haven't invested enough in it. Yeah. So, but um, I think they're going to have to make some decisions fairly quickly. And I listen to you and I listen to my thoughts. And I'm thinking it's coming to an election year, a presidential election year. Who is going to want to say, I want to raise the age for Medicare yeah. uh, or make you pay uh, higher taxes or any of this? Yeah. So so let me just say one, you know, I'm, I'm an economist and I was a labor economist. So so this is coming from my historical training. Uh, you know, what we don't do in this country is ask why healthcare is so expensive. <laughs> And then you look and see that a doctor in the United States makes almost twice as much as a doctor in, in the Europe. <laughs> and so, and then you look and say, you know, 65 to 75% of every dollar in healthcare goes to somebody's income, whether it's a nurse, a doctor, <laughs> you know, uh, a, a, a lab worker. And so the question I always ask is that, do we fundamentally need to restructure the pay <laughs> in this industry? You know, has it got completely out of hand? Uh, and, and, you know, uh, should, you know, should a, should an orthopedic surgeon who does, you know, enough knee replacements to make $400,000 a year, you know, does he really, you know, should he really get paid 400 or, or should he just get paid 200 and all the knee replacements get cut in half, you know? So, so again, I, I, I do think that we, because of the power of the lobby of the healthcare organizations, we never talk about how we could reduce the cost of medicine by thinking about whether or not providers in the United States are overpaid. Uh, uh, and again, I'll just ask you, because you lived in Europe, do you think the doctors in Europe are half as good as the United States doctors? Uh, I think it's very individual yeah, as it is yeah. here. As it is here, right? Yeah. You know, um, yeah. So anyhow, I just, I'll just throw that out as, you know, something that you might want to do in another podcast some other day. But, but again, nobody really talks about that aspect of it. And, and, you know, again, I think that, because hospitals tend to be not for profit, people don't look at sort of how they're spending that money, you know, and 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 are they really efficiently operated? Uh, and so again, I, I'll just I'll just say that that's something that that potentially could avoid having the federal government have to step in. But again, somebody's got to do something to get that ball rolling, and and I don't know who it is. I mean. 
Well, I, I think I I, uh, I think that healthcare systems um, that are government supported, you know, like the ones in Europe, are having similar discussions about yeah. the way they have always run their healthcare. Right, right. I um, think that's true. Yep. Be because of the two things that that I can see, just as an ordinary person, which is the enormous costs of the new drugs coming out. Right. They're life saving, but they but nobody can afford them. Yeah. Uh, and um, and the same thing with the procedures, you know, right. um, and th that is the healthcare industry. Yeah. It doesn't cost as much outside of our country because yeah. other countries negotiate everything. Right. No, no they do. And especially but it's drugs. Still expensive. Yeah. But but I always say this. I mean, again, I ask them my business school class this all the time. I say, look, when my kids were. 12 and 13 year olds old and starting having friends over, we finished the basement and we put a 45 inch screen TV <laughs> down there and it cost almost $6,000. <laughs> you know, the other day we, we, we bought a TV that was bigger and it cost less than $500. <laughs> you know, you know, we've been doing, you know, knee replacements for 40 years and the price just goes up every year. You know? Yeah. And I'm told uh, by my vet who just had a, uh, a new yeah. one, he'd had an old one yeah. um, that it's one, two, three, and you can go home and I can go back to work in 10 days. And, you know, yeah. it's much faster, the whole process because yeah, right. yep. the, the parts of the, the replacement are so much better. Faster, yeah. Well, or the, yeah. The, and, the, and the robotical execution. execution and the, and the physical therapy. Is so your, yeah. If a robot does most of your work, yeah. then where goes this high price you charge? For? Yeah. 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 Well, that, that's, that's, that's because we don't track cost in healthcare at that level. Nobody can tell you what, what 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 it really really costs to do a procedure we, we can complain and complain as a hospital administrator well we can't do this surgery if you pay me x <laughs> but you know the truth is you could probably produce x at half the price you you think it costs you know if you actually looked at what it cost <laughs> so well i'm gonna wrap it up here okay because great thank you the subject for like uh, a lot of <laughs> uh, yeah. future podcasts um and and I'm I'm looking at my list of questions here, and at the very bottom it said why why why, <laughs> <laughs> because I ran out of I had a million whys to why things are this way. Yeah, well, like I say, most of it's historical accident in the United States, and then the lobby whoever has the advantage lobby so efficient that to not lose it. And again, I'll, 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 I'll stop with one little story. I used to have a, a guy who ran a medical uh, device company in, in a community where he, you know, took oxygen to people's homes and sold wheelchairs and all that kind of stuff. And he would tell our class that he spent 40% of his time every day reading legislative stuff in, in the local and federal government to make sure that no bill, he didn't call his congressman or his local house representative about why they shouldn't do that if it was going to infect his business. And so he always argued that small healthcare businesses in the United States is all about protecting your self-interest and, and they're very, they get very good at it. So thank you so much for coming on and spending the time. Okay. Well, I've enjoyed it very much. Great, great to somebody's doing this, asking these kinds of questions. Cause I think it's really important that, that people have a better understanding of what coverage they actually have and what their options are in, in all these programs. So, yes. Thank you. All right, Steve. Thanks. Of course, we could go on and on about how to fix Medicare and how to fix health care in general. And in future podcasts, we will. There are so many great ideas out there. And in fact, if you have ideas, I'd like to hear about them. Perhaps you could write your idea in the comments section of the place that you hear or watch your podcast, or just send me an email through my website, the websites at the very end of the podcast. And you might want to go back to episode 14 to refresh your memory on affordable care plans, or perhaps just play these two episodes again back to back. And many thanks to our expert guide throughout, Dr. Stephen D. Culler, Associated Professor at the Rollins School of Public Health and Affiliated Associate Professor at the Guazetta Business School at Emory University in Atlanta. 
Our next podcast will be about drugs. No, not those kind of drugs, medical drugs, often life-saving drugs, which come at prices that you could buy a Lamborghini for. All countries except the U.S. negotiate with Big Pharma for lower drug prices. Here, you and the insurance companies negotiate over who's going to pay the most for that drug that you need. And unless you run a hedge fund, how can you possibly pay for some of these newest and best drugs yourself? I schedule one new podcast a month, so look for this newest podcast in December. Usually the podcast drops on the third Tuesday of every month. Updates wherever you get your podcasts. And I'd really, really appreciate it if you'd subscribe and, of course, share. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify, TuneIn, iHeart, Podchaser, and my host platform, the Podbeam app. The video version on YouTube. Show notes and links on my website, www.stephanieshelton.com forward slash conversations. I'm Stephanie Shelton, and until I see you again, please take care of yourself and all those you love. Conversations on Health, How We Get There is produced and edited by Frank Harold. Research assistance from Dr. Richard Saltman, Professor Emeritus of Health Policy and Management, Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University in Atlanta. 